Hi everyone and thanks for watching my talk today. My name is Trevor Pettit and I am an upcoming master's student at Western University. Today I'm going to talk about my undergraduate thesis work on modeling soil carbon cycling in boreal peatlands under future climate warming scenarios. The boreal ecozone spans across most of northern Canada as shown on the map on this slide. Boreal peatlands are a unique ecosystem found in this ecozone. Peatlands are defined by the accumulation of undecomposed organic material in excess of 40 centimeters. Boreal peatlands are unique because despite covering only 3% of the Earth's land area, they are responsible for more than one third of the carbon sequestered in soil globally. Carbon sequestration describes the process by which carbon dioxide is removed from the atmosphere and stored in the soils. This function is facilitated by photosynthesis and above ground vegetation. Photosynthesis produces fixed carbon inputs to the soil food web in the form of leaf litter and root exudates. This fixed carbon enters the soil food web when it is consumed by primary decomposers like bacteria and fungi. As individuals in the soil food web die, they contribute to the detrital pool. But soil organisms also release atmospheric carbon dioxide as a function of respiration. On this slide, arrows of different widths represent different rates of carbon movement. For example, soils store more carbon than they release by respiration. Thus, soil systems are considered carbon sinks. Conversely, carbon sources are systems that contribute towards the global accumulation of atmospheric carbon dioxide. Warming is associated with changes in metabolism in our soil communities, like that represented by our simple food chain on the right of this slide. These changes in metabolism are associated with increased rates of respiration and subsequently decreased rates of carbon sequestration. Thus, warming may drive a change in soils from a carbon sink to a carbon source. So, I sought to compare energy cycling in a peatland soil food web under varying degrees of warming to further our understanding of how warming affects soil carbon sequestration. I hypothesized that the flow of energy in a soil food web would change under warming conditions because peatland warming will affect the metabolism of individuals and population biomasses. Following the Metabolic Theory of Ecology, or the MTE, I predicted that the warming-related changes in metabolic rate and biomasses would correspond with increased rates of energy cycling and decreased rates of carbon sequestration in the soil food web. Next, I'm going to quickly review my methods. I will be using experimental biomass data available from a warming experiment performed at the BRACE experimental peatland site. BRACE is an acronym for the biological response to a changing environment. This experiment compared soil fauna under active warming as facilitated by heating rods to passive warming as facilitated by open top chambers like those shown on this slide and control warming. The site is located in White River, Ontario, as shown on the right of the slide. Flux describes the movement of energy, or carbon, that corresponds to a trophic interaction between a given resource and its consumer. I use a network modeling R package called FluxWeb based on energetic food web principles to estimate flux in the brace food web. To show how this model works, I will use the simple food chain shown on this slide. The first step of this model is to calculate the metabolic losses of our consumers according to the MTE. Metabolic losses of our top level predators serve to calibrate the metabolic demand of the entire food web. Given the assimilation efficiency of our top level consumer, we can now estimate the amount of energy needed to meet this metabolic demand. Finally, we can calculate flux down the food chain given the assimilation efficiency of our lower level consumers and the metabolic demand of our top level consumers. But the MTE predicts that metabolism will change under warming. We can estimate metabolic losses at any temperature according to the allometric relationship described by the MTE shown by the equation on the right of this slide in red. These changes in metabolic rate, represented by the blue box on this slide, represent the effects of warming on individuals. We also expect that population biomasses will change under warming, as populations may increase or decrease under warming. We can estimate these changes in biomass with experimental data. These changes in biomass, represented by the yellow box on this slide, 
represent the effect of warming on populations. To examine the whole soil community under warming, which is made up of populations of individuals, we must both consider changes in individuals and in populations. I have used these methods to estimate flux throughout the entire brace food web. Note that the simplified food chain I showed earlier in this presentation is just one example of a food chain represented by this larger soil food web. Thus, I followed the same steps to estimate energy cycling in the whole soil food web that I have just shown for a simple three-node food chain. Also, note that arrows on this slide are only meant to represent connectivity. Although each arrow in this food web is the same width, the actual flow of energy corresponding to each individual interaction will vary. Finally, note that we can distinguish four trophic groupings in this larger soil food web as shown by the color coding on this slide in the key. So, to test my hypotheses and predictions, I used three model scenarios. With the metabolic losses, or M scenario, I modeled the metabolic rate as a function of temperature to test the effect of warming on individuals. With the biomass, or B scenario, I modeled biomass as a function of temperature to test the effect of warming on populations. With the metabolic losses and biomass, or MB scenario, I modeled both metabolic rate and biomass as a function of temperature to test the effect of warming on the whole soil community. Thus, this MB scenario is the combination of the M and B model scenarios. In this experiment, I used three different warming treatments. These warming treatments form a gradient I used to test the effects of warming on energy flux in the braced soil food web. The control treatment corresponds to the average brace growing season temperature. The plus 2 degrees Celsius warming treatment corresponds to passive warming at brace. The plus 4 degrees Celsius warming treatment corresponds to active warming at brace. Now I'm going to go over my results. These data represent the total system flux, or the sum of all fluxes corresponding to each trophic interaction in the soil food web. Each box represents the flux of energy in grams of carbon per gram of soil dry weight per year cycled by the entire soil food web under each combination of model scenario represented by different columns and warming treatments represented by different rows. Note that the calculation of flux for each model scenario under the control treatment is identical because we expect no change in flux parameters. Here, we can see that flux increased with increased warming at the level of the individual, but also that flux decreased with increased warming at the level of the population. This makes sense given we know metabolic rate increases with warming and given we expect some populations to increase and other populations to decrease under warming. At the level of the whole soil community, flux again increases with increasing temperature, but this increase is smaller than what we observed at the level of the individual. Again, this makes sense because the MB model scenario accounts for changes in both individuals and the population. We can also look at trends in flux by trophic grouping. These data represent the mean flux of an interaction in grams of carbon per gram of soil dry weight per year within each trophic grouping of the soil food web. These mean values are calculated based on the estimated flux of carbon corresponding to each interaction defined by the brace food web for consumers of each trophic grouping. If we start by only looking at our control group, we see that energy cycling is greatest in our lowest order trophic grouping and is smallest in our highest order trophic grouping. Now we can also add our M model scenario shown in blue. Note that like our control data, flux at the level of the individual tends to be greatest in our highest order trophic groupings and least in our lowest order trophic groupings. Consistent with the trends in our total system flux, we can see at the level of the individual that flux within each trophic grouping increases with temperature. This makes sense given we expect the metabolic rates of individuals to increase with temperature. Now, we can also add our B model scenario shown in yellow. Note that like our, both our control data and the M model scenario, flux at the level of the population tends to be greatest in our highest order trophic groupings and least in our lowest order trophic groupings. 
Also, consistent with the trends in our total system flux, we can see at the level of the population that flux within each trophic grouping decreases with temperature. Again, this makes sense given we expect some populations in our food web to increase under warming and other populations to decrease. Finally, we can also add our MB model scenario shown in green. Note that, consistent with all other data in this experiment, flux at the level of the community tends to be greatest in our highest order trophic groupings and least in our lowest order trophic groupings. Consistent with the trends in our total system flux, we can also see at the level of the community that flux within each trophic grouping decreases with temperature. Again, this makes sense given our soil community is comprised of populations of individuals. Across all three model scenarios, we can now see that flux tends to be inversely related to the trophic order of a given consumer. Also, across all level of consumers, when we consider warming-related metabolic changes in both individuals and populations of soil fauna, we can see that flux tends to increase with temperature at the level of the community. Here, I just wanted to briefly show that I have also conducted statistical analyses to test for differences in flux within each trophic grouping by both temperature treatment and model scenario. The end values shown on this slide represent the number of total interactions within each trophic grouping. Each interaction is a replicate I used to test for differences in average flux. Changes in flux were not significantly different for any warming treatment or model scenario for any trophic grouping. Similarly, no combination of warming treatment and model scenario had a significant effect on flux. This is likely because of limitations in the resolution of the food web as reflected by the large standard error in the data. So, I'm going to wrap things up with just a few takeaways. We saw that in our soil food web communities, carbon cycling tends to increase under warming. This observation is consistent with previous research that suggests warming-related shifts in peatland vegetative communities are associated with reduced carbon sequestration. We also saw that these changes in carbon cycling tend to be driven by warming-related increases in the metabolic rate of individuals, and that these changes in flux tend to be limited by warming-related changes in, the pop in population biomasses. These observations are consistent with the MTE and our predictions. Finally, we also saw that the flux tends to be inversely related to the trophic order of a given consumer. Given the large amount of carbon sequestered in boreal peatland soils, it is important to consider these systems as we continue to implement sustainable soil management strategies. Thus, I would like to end on the note that all of these findings are consistent with the idea that carbon sequestration decreases in boreal peatlands under warming conditions. As I wrap up my presentation, I just wanted to thank everyone from the Lindo Lab, including Dr. Lindo, Dr. Brand Furin, Rob, Carlos, Matt, and Shaylin for all the help they've given me on this project. This is the end of my presentation. Thanks for listening.